Well, that was anticlimactic. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to Can Producers or Can Musicians, depending on which website you looked at, coexist with AI. We're really happy to have you here. I know most of you were out last night. It's really nice of you to come uh, so early in the morning. Uh, let's jump right in. We have an incredible panel. We have a short amount of time. We're going to leave 10 minutes for questions at the end. First off, we'd like to get to know you a little bit. Raise your hand if you're an artist. Awesome. Raise your hand if you're a label. Raise your hand if you're a startup or entrepreneur. Raise your hand if you work in AI. Awesome. We're really excited to have you here. We're going to make sure this is a valuable time for you. Let's jump right in with introductions. This is an incredible panel. I'm really honored to be with you guys. Uh, hi, I'm Jay, uh, also known under my artist alias Capson. Uh, I'm the creative director of Splice Sounds. I'm also a creative uh, strategist at Splice as well. Uh, I also founded a number of uh, sample and royalty free businesses. Yo, what's up, everybody? My name's MJ. I am the CEO and founder of Lemonade Music. Uh, our goal is to just help music producers and empower them using artificial intelligence. So super excited to be here today. Um, I'm also a rap artist. been rapping since I was 11 years old. So that's almost two decades of doing that. So uh, yeah, that's me. What's up? I'm Tantu Beats. Um, I've been making a living off of selling beats online for about 10 years now. Uh, and uh, since this summer, I'm also a number one Billboard charting producer. Screw yeah. yeah, let's go. I'm Helen. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm co-founder at Newbird. This is an AI music startup that utilizes uh, samples to create uh, tracks or uh, streams. I uh, would love to share uh, my ideas and what we're up to today. So thanks for having me too. Hey everyone, thanks for coming today. I'm Abe Batchon, the CEO of BeatStars, um, a music online licensing marketplace, um, helping music producers like Tantu make a living for 10 years. Uh, I'm also a rap artist, so if you want to battle after this, this session, I will battle the fuck out of you if you want, <laughs> if you want to. But I uh, appreciate y'all. Uh, thanks, guys. What an incredible panel. I'll try to introduce myself as quickly as I can. I'm elderly, so I've done a lot. I owned a house music label in Chicago in 1989. I put out Derek Carter's records when we were teenagers. Uh, then I ran Wax Tracks Records. I had my first number one in 1991 with the KLF, What Time Is Love? Uh, later, I was the Beatport CEO. Then I sold Metapop to Native Instruments and ran digital there for a number of years. And I'm now the co-founder of Psalms.ai, an enterprise solution. We build custom AI-based models, and we have a patent pending attribution engine, the only one in the world for AI. I'm really excited. Let me start with a challenging conversation topic. AI, job killer? Please comment. I don't think so. Tell me At why. least if you're, if you're talking about my job as a, as a producer. Um, I think AI in the end will always, of course, like I am not developing the AI. I see myself as the user of AI, uh, in my case for producing songs or beats. Um, <clears throat> but I think in the end it will always come down to the creator to use the AI as the tool and not <clears throat> the other way around. Um, and that's how I've experienced it so far as well. Facts, I love that. Um, I think you actually use our product as well, so I'm curious to hear your take on it. but. I feel like we all want to be on the same page first. What is AI? It's three steps. It's your training data, training a model, and then using that model to make predictions. So is AI a job killer? Well, to a point, AI is so dependent on creators, because imagine if you, know, you train a certain data set on a certain type of beat style or whatnot, and the AI can only output that type of beat, and that's all it's going to be able to do until creators come out and continue pushing the boundaries of what AI can do. So I think they're going to be co, uh, uh, co-dependent on existing. But uh, yeah, I definitely don't think it's a job killer. Um, I think there's a huge amount of potential for assistive tools, especially in music creation. I think there's potential for certain areas of finished music to be disrupted and are being disrupted. Um, I think I focus on the creation aspect, and we're already seeing that producers, musicians are, are taking advantage of these tools to not only assist them with basic admin tasks and creation, but also with inspiration. Um, 
So I think there's definitely areas where there's potential for, I, I don't like the job killer because I think there's always gonna be a differentiation between something that's human made and something that's AI made. Maybe the end listener, user, won't know, doesn't care, that's to be seen. Mm -hmm. But I think in the creation process, uh, yeah, there's a ton of, ton of potential to be assistive and collaborative with the creator as opposed to replacing them. Well, Helen, tell us how you envision that collaboration happening. Yeah, actually, uh, there are different approaches to AA music generation right now. Uh, some of them uh, exclude musicians. The only way how they use him is to train models on the samples or master tracks. What we do, uh, we generate music from samples, so leaving a space for musician and for the human creativity so that you could cut uh, the time uh, for music production at, at the very moment, license your stems, not master tracks, but stems, uh, for usage uh, in social media and like using it as royalty-free music. So it could be just an additional stream because uh, the problem now with uh, Epidemic Sound and other uh, guys from the sector of stock music, uh, people still write music, they spend a lot of time, and as I know that uh, the most sold songs are actually, actually trending ones, so like corporate style and something like this. So there is no like creativity for the uh, authors, and when uh, the AI, like Mubert, comes, it could simply help you mix your stems with the stems of other people and create different music pieces and license this for different use cases for businesses and for personal use cases as well. So for us, it's uh, it's one of the mission statements. So as we are musicians ourselves, we know the pain points and we see that big companies tend to replace uh, artists who make production music for ads and businesses uh, with AI so that it could be cheaper. What we wish to do, we wish to make a model where AI and musician coexist and make just additional revenue streams. Abe, how are you seeing people use it on your platform? I think, I think with, with how we're Watching the creator community on BeatStars um, use tools like Lemonade or, or Mubird is that we live in our kind of like the success metric for, for creators on BeatStars is the scalability of their catalog and diversity of their catalog. They're, we're, we live in a non-exclusive model. They maintain all the rights, but they're feeding um, a cohort of creators, you know, millions of other recording artists all over the world. So they, they have to constantly be able to, to, you know, build and accelerate the, the, the release of their catalog as quickly as possible. Traditional music producers can live with making a beat a month or a beat a week. In the online game, if you're not generating and creating 10, 15 tracks, 20 tracks a month, you're probably not going to exist in the marketplace. So what, how we're seeing, you know, tools like Lemonade that gives you, you know, a four-bar melody, a loop to accelerate the process to create beats. So where producers now are seeing themselves create four, five, ten beats a day rather than one. And in terms of, you know, the music marketplace, that just is a key to unlock scalability for creators and, and for them to build their own business. So we're seeing it as a positive in our community and I think you know, the, you know, the metrics speak for itself and you know, we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot of great success with it. There's, there's already so much music. When I owned a house label in Chicago, it was a big week when there were 100 new 12 inches at the store in a week. Uh, we're at 120,000 published tracks a day which probably means there's 500,000 tracks finished and several million unfinished tracks a day. Uh, I would posit there's already too much music. Are we, are we exasperating that problem? MJ? Yeah, I, um, I have a slightly different take. Like, what is the problem with too much music is almost the way that I would rephrase it. Because at the end of the day, I know for me, music was so important. Um, like, I grew up without a father. I grew up broke. And thank God for music. It honestly saved my life. So even if I were to not even upload that track, but, like, still be able to create, that would be so meaningful for me. So for me, if we're able to empower more creators and allow people to like make music that was never able to before, interact with a da and be like, man, that melody in a weird way healed my trauma or like, you know, that melody in a weird way like made me feel something, that's an amazing thing. And so what? It's uploaded to Spotify. Don't listen to it if you don't like it on the other end of it, right? But for me, I think it's actually a good thing there's too much music. Yeah, I agree with him. I mean, music is healing. Like he said, um, it got 
me through a lot of my de your early ages of, of development and all the challenges that I was facing in my life. I didn't care if people were going to listen to it on the other end. It was sufficient for me to complete something. And for a lot of young people, you know, building, building things like this and completing things like this is just another like prerequisite to do other things in life too and be successful at other things. So I, I, don't, I don't, you know, it has other other usage than just, you know, the Spotify world, you know. I completely agree. I think recreational music is the, going to be the recreational music creation is going to be the fastest growing segment of our market over the next decade. Uh, uh, it's going to be like golf or basketball. Uh, you play those things, but you don't necessarily envision you're going to do it professionally, but it's still a very important part of your life. Um, uh, what are some of the challenges? We've been rah rah rahing so far because all of our companies are tied to the success of AI. But what are some of the challenges and pitfalls you all are trying to help the market avoid? I'm um, going to start with it. You right there. Yeah, I'll, I'll go on this. Um, I think with Splice introducing the AI product Create, um, which is specifically built around uh, AI helping users find more options, more inspiration. So taking a seed sample from the entire library and being able to use the AI technology to explore the library and find complementary sounds that may work with that. It's speeding up the process, but it's not doing it in a way where it's finishing it for you. Um, and you have more control over generating new stacks of ideas, finding new ideas. And it's the same process all people are already doing using the catalog, but getting you to things that you might never find. There are, at this point, I don't know the exact number, two and a half plus million sounds in the Splice library. Um, no one can search all of that. So having a tool that can find things that you might otherwise not find, and also things that are less popular or are more like rare finds, there's an element of collaboration in that and offering you options. I think one of the challenges we saw, um, most people don't know, Splice has a long history of having an audio science team in-house since before I was at the company. There's been uh, exploration and research going on for a long time and a lot of the tools that work underneath Splice are AI already. The similar sounds function has been AI for years. It's just not something we call AI, it's machine learning, but it doesn't need to be the main thing we talk about because it's there to assist and do the job. Um, the challenge is that we know that users don't want press a button, out comes a song. And anything we get close to that that mm. feels like that starts to take away from the creative process. And again, it depends at what stage in the creative process the product or the company exists as to how your users might interact with it. Um, but we know at the stage where we're trying to create inspiration and help with the creative process, the further we get down the line of feeling like a finished song or too far down the line with it finishing your idea for you, that actually turns people off. And it's definitely a challenge to be enthusiastic and excited about all the things we can do, but also put it in a way that are what people want to use and still feels like they're making music as opposed to that press a button and out comes a song. And I think that's a challenge for everyone in, in using these tools is, is how far to take it at this stage and when your users are ready and, and actually tailoring it to what they want, not just being excited about what it can do and throwing all of it out into, into the world. Because I think it is a challenge, especially for creators who there's an element of them feeling like they can be replaced. And, and when they get that feeling, especially when you're in the moment of making music, that's a, that's a big turn off for people. Yeah, I love that. Um, something I love that Splice did was, I feel like automating the search for sampling. Um, so it's like a search AI tool, which is amazing, especially given all the samples you guys have. Um, so Lemonade is in the, the generation space. So it's taking a training data set and then generating a brand new melody based on a training data set. So I just want y'all to empathize with artists for a moment. It sounds like there's a decent amount of artists in the rooms. In the room, imagine you were an artist, you uploaded this crazy catalog to the internet, whatever website, BeatStars, et cetera, and then companies were just using your data to train an algorithm to then generate brand new music. That is your intellectual property, and companies are able to take advantage of that. Um, and to me, that's really sad, like going back to, you know, I'm design artist first, technologist second. So being an artist, I'm like, holy crap, if that happened to me, I'd be so pissed. I'd like, you know, want to file a lawsuit or whatever it may be, but I wouldn't even know where to start or how. 
So artists are being taken advantage of, which is really sad. So the, the challenge in this space of AI generation is all about sourcing ethical data sets. And to us, that means working with producers like Tantu, et cetera, um, that are, we're able to have individual conversations with and be like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is our process. We want to pay you for this data. We want to make sure you're cool with us generating based on your IP. And by the way, we built several algorithms, not just for generation, but also to ensure what we generate is not what you had provided us. So we put so much intentionality behind it, and that's why we're grateful for BeatStars as well, because now we're able to scale this to thousands of producers, and all the individual conversations we had are super dope. So I feel good about it, and you can feel good when you're using the tool, because to me, it's almost like, if you were like, if you bought your own Ferrari, it'd feel really good, but if you were driving in a stolen Ferrari, you'd be like, it's kind of cool to have this Ferrari, but it doesn't feel right, you know what I mean? So that's what I feel, that's how I feel when I use something that like I question the ethics with it. I'm just like, I don't know how like the real deal this is. Um, so starting from the source being the real deal makes you feel like as an artist, you can really close the gap, so. Is it just a quick show of hands? Does everyone here sort of understand what we're talking about when we talk about training on people's data? Oh, it's just, okay. Just some of you. It, the, the short answer is any AI system is a giant meat grinder. And that it needs a whole bunch of meat put into it. And that meat is, in our case, music of different kinds. And if we're talking about the big LLMs that you've seen demonstrate themselves online, in large part, they have all already trained on your data, whether you like it or not. Just like Google, they have scraped the internet and even worse, they have scraped the dark web, and they have trained on every piece of content they can find. Uh, and what we're all talking about here is doing it differently, making sure that the people who actually are the meat are treated with respect, opt in, and are able to be compensated uh, for what happens uh, with their content. Um, but, uh, yeah, but um, you know, unfortunately, doing it different and doing it ethically is not going to stop like the bad actors no. from accelerating their product to potentially replace creators. You know, I think part of me is really scared about the future. To be honest with you, um, I, I believe a lot of the technology that's already out there is capable of generating full tracks that can can replace creators. Um, but fortunately. The music industry has a lot of legal and a lot of lawyers in place to protect intellectual property and uh, creators' rights. The music industry wouldn't exist if 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 creators were being replaced. Um, so it's going to be like an interesting next 24 months, I would say, and you know, just to kind of watch and see how this all plays out. Um, but I I think with you know the way that we're building our businesses and, and a lot of others are building their businesses, I think there's gonna be a lot of uh, companies that are championed to kind of lead the way and make sure that creators are protected. And, but you know, at the end of the day, it's the Pandora's box has been open and uh, there's gonna be, you know, there's gonna be a lot of companies that are gonna face hell probably in terms of a legal, legal um, perspective. So it's gonna be a long battle for sure. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when people were mad that sequencing was invented. Uh, I'm old enough to remember people were mad at drum machines. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure there are more drummers now than there were in the 80s. Uh, uh, so it, it, it changes some people's jobs, but there's also no doubt in my mind that some session and production music creators have been displaced already. Ad agencies, Muzak type background music companies are already gravitating towards well, not paying people if they possibly can. Um, what can we do to curtail that as a market? Because you, you said you know that you see that as, as interesting and maybe a little scary. What can we do about it? Is, is it is it something we have to do something about? I don't I don't know, Mr. Beats. Tell us. Be because I, I think. The, the, the things that are being replaced are by, like, by define the, on the less creative side of, of things. Like, uh, let's say, th talking about library music, usually heavily based on, like, reference, reference tracks anyways. Like, the, if you look at how people create those types of music, which is already sort of like an AI-generated song, but 
the AI is the, is the human. It's almost like, okay, I have the, this reference track, I'll just create something that sounds just like it. And this is what comes out, and the ad agency is happy because they don't have to license the, the actual track that they have to pay a lot for. And you know, if I think if, if we want to push the world to like a creative height, it, I think it's very important that those people will always have their platform, and I think they always will, even with AI replacing half of all we can do. I think the, the people that use music to 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 connect the world in a better way and like yeah kind of um tell their story in the way that the people are eager to hear it they will always be there the cream will always rise to the top at least that's how how I, i've always I'll, seen it i'll add to that I'll, I'll say that if you are you know a super unique creator and probably mj and the ai companies are not going to like this this statement but if you're super unique and you're, you're super differentiated in the market and you have a distinct sound, I would not train your, your music to AI. If you, you gotta protect your business at the same time. But if you're uh, a creator that's generating mass market type of music that's out there for like production music or something like that, cool, go ahead. But if you wanna protect your uniqueness, just don't train your music. Just don't, don't have it be trained. Uniqueness is the most common word I have heard expressed on, on panels right now. And I think that's fascinating. Uh, at least when I ran Beatport, uniqueness was not what would get you in the top 10. It was sounding exactly like was already in the top 10 so that a beginner DJ could beat match those two things and feel special. Um, uh, how is uniqueness going to rise to the top in the future, given the algorithmic systems that drive sameness in front of every user? Um, I just add to this is partly on the previous point as well. I think to use your analogy of the the meat grinder, right? It, this is what I meant by where at what point in the creative process you exist as either a company or a product is we're speaking to the meat, <laughs> the meat being the artists, the creators, right? And businesses that are using music as a product, whether that be commercial music, library music for sync, they've never been looking to pay artists and or at least not pay well. So that's always been trying to go to the bottom. When we're in the creative process, I think uniqueness doesn't necessarily mean crazy and different. Uniqueness might just mean a slight spin on something that's familiar, but it feels new, right? I mean, that's what we're doing in a lot of genres. Like there are signature pieces of a genre or you know, certain drum sounds, or whatever it might be that lets you know that it's something familiar and you know it, and uniqueness is, is in the niches, right? I, I believe that to the point of the amount of music that's coming out, the best possible scenario, if, if AI is driving a huge amount of new music on top of the huge amount of new music we had, is that actually brings it back to fans and super fans, that people want that human connection, right? And they, they still care. At, at the end of the day, when I listen to a piece of music and I love it, sometimes I don't care who made it, but if I really love it, I want to find out who made it, who's, who's the human behind it, why did they make it? And maybe I want to go to their show, I want to see them play. I don't think fans are going anywhere. So... That uniqueness, I think, or I hope, is going to come from continuing fan bases and being able to build fan bases for independent creators that they don't necessarily need to rely on a lot of the traditional music systems to make money, but they can work directly with their fan base. And those fans care because it's human made. And maybe they use some AI aspects within their creation, but there's still a human that they can engage with. I don't think that's going anywhere. I hope not. And maybe the amount of AI based or full AI music will actually drive people back to looking for the humans behind the music. Helen, I would imagine most of your users are not professional musicians when they start yeah, working right, with your platform, the bedroom producers, which right. is very different than the challenge they have at Splice, which was just articulated, which is we don't want musicians to feel displaced by our products. Is, is the brand new creator a, a different animal in terms of what they want? Uh, no, actually, like uh, people, all of our creators uh, join us like at the very beginning we re when we were one of the first actually to do AI music, uh, and the most of these producers uh, could not make funds like on their uh, creative music because it's really hard uh, to promote yourself, of course. And Mubert for them was so to say an additional stream of revenue, and it still is. So uh, these kind of producers, they are all right with submitting their music to 
production music so that it could be played in elevators. <laughs> that, and the thing that everybody asks, we are talking about like a huge uh, record labels because when you come to them and tell that um, we need their samples to use in production music, um, they tell me like, uh, how do I ask the author, the artist, that his music will go on and pay, uh, be played in elevator or in some stories, like that's the problem. But for our musicians as well, like a fresh ear, uh, because uh, producing music for uh, music stocks is a bit different because, again, as you told, like a beat board, you uh, promote music that is most popular on the platform. So all of the authors who actually wanted to create something uh, of their style, they just simply didn't make any money because they didn't. N nobody bought this. It was not like uh, popular on the platform. With Muber, as people uh, made the uh, samples, not the master tracks. It was different because um, the audience might lo loved some of the samples, like the bass part or something. Um, but uh, they spent some time, and they and actually the. Interesting thing with Mubert is m most creators uh, just open their demos that they could never finish, uh, and they just submitted the samples. So that's how it works. It's like recycling. Uh, so as our approach, like you can recycle your uh, your demos because each musician has lots of them on the computer. So uh, that's what they liked mostly, and they that's how we actually started. And then we created this marketplace where people were just uh, creating sample packs by reference. Again, the same thing because it's like pr uh, production music. Uh, it's not about creativity. Uh, I guess that in your case, like when we we're talking about creativity, a AI should only be the tool to enhance like mastering, mixing, something like this. When we're talking about uh, library music, that's kind of different thing. Uh, it's not a creative process, it's a commercial process. So just making sample packs is okay, as I see it. It's better for the market because it saves time uh, and gives opportunity to just get some of the demos and just throw it into the new bird and then start making money. Can I, can I just add, just because the, I think samples is an interesting, it's a, it's a whole other topic to get into in terms of generative AI replacing samples or loops specifically. I think there's already a world where they can exist together and the creator can make the decision of how they feel about it or what they want to use. And the, the tough thing about this conversation is that being, producers are so split already on what's okay and what's not okay and the tools that they are allowed to use or the process you're allowed to do or whether you're allowed to use loops or or how far into the process you go. Like, there's already such a splintered conversation about what's the right way to make music that trying to then add on like how AI is gonna play into that. I don't think there is a right way, right? There's, there's, so, many, there's so many routes to the end goal which is just you know, making a song at the end of it or maybe it's not even making a song, it's just the process of producing. So I think trying to get to um, there's obviously no right answer, but I think all of the opinions can be correct for different producers and musicians, because that's already the case, is there's so many different avenues to get to where they want to go. Excellent, thank you. The good news is fully generative AI is shit at writing songs right now. Uh, it just is. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a technological barrier that has not been solved. Uh, someone's going to solve it. It might be my team. It might be someone else's team. Um, and then we'll all copy each other and solve it for everybody. Um, but that day is still far off in the purely generative space. It can make something that I, I call it musical, but it's not quite music yet today. But Which is why I think it's such a great tool for creative inspiration. Um, so we have just a couple minutes left and then we're going to jump to questions. I would love each of you to tell me what the next five years looks like. Go. Shit. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, more, I think, you know, just the other day, M me and MJ were on a Zoom call. I've never made a beat before. You know, I've never made a beat before. And we made a beat together. He showed me how to use Lemonade, incorporated a loop, put that into my, my logic, you know, added, we added some drums. It was pretty damn good. And I think what you're going to see is a lot of, like, amateur, novice people that are interested in music, just don't know how to get started into it, are gonna get introduced to it. It already is. I mean, a lot of these like beat maker apps already have a lot of like pre-made samples and loops already kind of pre, 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 uh, predefined and then it creates like the rest of it for you. So there's, a, there's already a lot of like 
introductory steps to getting into making music, and I think that's probably what's going to happen. Everyone's going to be making music. Everyone's going to be able to like create music. Is it going to be good? Probably not, because you still need that human curation. Still need that. The, the way that you know music producers and creatives kind of like arrange the right sounds and sound selection, you're still going to need splice. You're still going to need all the all these tools. I think it's going to continue. I think the creator economy is going to continue exploding. I think the monetization um, for it may max out at some point. You know, it may max out. You know, it's things are going to get devalued a little bit. I think um, the more and more the market gets saturated and the more and more uh, less and less creators are being paid for even for training music and for all, all of these things, it's going to be a challenge to like really create a living. We're already seeing that on the Spotify end for artists. It's fractions and fractions of a penny. Like it's, it's pretty tough. So, but I think, you know, the cream will always rise to the top and those folks will continue to kind of like pave the way. Um, but yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a challenge in kind of like environment for a lot of creators. People are gonna have to stand out. They're gonna have to like find. They already are. They're finding multiple alternative ways to generate revenue for their music um, outside of just creating the music itself. So it's gonna be interesting. Thanks, buddy. Helen. Yeah, for sure. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, me personally, I'm not a musician myself, but I had a couple of uh, sound production courses and then actually learned how to make the composition with Mubert because it helped me a lot, like an inspiration tool. Uh, what I think about the industry, I guess that uh, it will be changing towards the AI for sure. Um, the ethical AI, of course, uh, because we are talking with the major labels like four years already, trying to negotiate a deal, but that's a huge uh, work with the paper, they don't want to do this unless they feel that they can make money in the industry. And the one thing that I don't like, actually, there's a tendency uh, that people want to call themselves musicians by just distributing the AI music. But it's not right. It's not part of our strategy, and I think that's uh, not a creative process. That's what I usually tell people when they ask me, why don't you have such a license? You know, because I don't recognize this as creative process, because you just want to monetize someone's work uh, and call yourself a musician, but you're not. You've never done something. So that's the only thread that I see. Uh, but definitely everyone will go uh, in the niche because um, they all, big guys go there when they see money. Once they see it, they definitely come into the sphere. Yeah. Um, I think talking about the producer's pr perspective of things, I think it will introduce more people, like you guys said as well, to the art of music production and uh, being an artist as well, which I think is great, which will, in the next five years, greatly uh, like have a lot of impact on the, the increase in size of the, also the technology that's being built, uh, or how do you say that, like the, the market that's being built around upcoming musicians and the tools they, they might use. Uh, I think for me as a producer and, and my colleagues, so to say, I think AI in the next few years will definitely make it make maybe the difference between which producers will be able to stay in the game for the longest uh, or yeah have the have the success they are they are trying to to achieve or maybe have the I think a lot of AI tools will definitely in the next couple of years also influence the sound of pop music definitely. And I think the producers that are in that sphere will have to adapt to uh, to those tools to stay in that sphere. Thank you. MJ? Man, I had time to think about this one. I still don't know. Um, I would say uh, it's going to get bad before it gets really good. And by that, I mean, I think uh, music might start to sound a lot more generic soon. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting because the people in the audience who is the market Y'all are, y'all are the ones that help artists decide what type of music they should be making if their goal is to make money. Um, so I think music might start to sound a little more generic or whatnot, but I think it was Metro Boomin who said this, but uh, he's not scared of AI because he's got that sauce. Like he's going to continue being unique, continue pushing, continue doing his thing. So I think eventually producers are going to be like, I need to get more unique. I need to start doing things to have my spin, to have my flair, to have my sound. And all of a sudden that generic stuff will start to become more unique and then we're going to be just saturated with just amazing music. So yeah, it's going to get good before it gets bad, but calm before the storm. Yeah, I would agree with, with that. Um, I think 
this is a lovely conversation about AI and music. I think there are plenty of places where the same conversation is happening where it's not musicians in the room. Um, so I think there are going to be a lot of challenges when it comes to especially the, the types of music we've talked about um, to the point about where the full song generation is going. The same thing if we asked the question five years ago of where AI art's going to be at. Like, I think in a year from now, we're going to be seeing that with music and five years is impossible to say. Um, the part I'm more interested in is the creators who are starting now, who are 10 years old, 12 years old, who are starting with this technology, who's where I started with Fruity Loops and you know, like breaks off records and like they're starting with these tools now. They're gonna wanna break them, they're gonna wanna do creative stuff with them, they're gonna wanna try and see what they wanna make. And as long as the desire to make their own music doesn't go away, they're still gonna just exist as tools. And whether that becomes a different process to how we started out, people are still gonna wanna create and they're still gonna wanna share. And um, I, I agree on the, the monetization side that that is, it's already changing, but hopefully to, um, to what I said earlier, there's still gonna be fans. We're already seeing that producers especially have to have multiple streams of income. That, that's something about creating samples on Splice and seeing a revenue stream from that or, or any other platform. Um, we're already seeing that producers, musicians are having to have multiple things which aren't the music they're releasing. And the music they're releasing is essentially, I, I hate to say, it's the, you know, the advert for the brand and then you build around it. But if that gives you the freedom to keep making music and actually have enough of a living to keep doing that, that's the dream for most people who started out with it. Um, so I hope that whilst the world of AI is looking to replace the humans, that the humans who still want to create are looking to connect with the people that want to connect with them. So there's, there's still a chance for them to have a career and to be able to share their music and keep doing what we're doing, e even with the tools being part of that. Matt, I want to add, you're, you're, you guys are working on something really interesting at Psalms, right? So I think that that's crucial for creators. If, if there's going to be an AI attribution engine that really identifies the output and all the different creators that contributed to that output, and then if governments out there start recognizing AI works as copyright works, because now we can identify all the different models that were trained with music and now we can attribute the percentages and ownership on the output. Um, that becomes an interesting conversation. I think alleviates a lot of the worry and stress for a lot of creators. So I'm, I'm hopeful for that and that's something you guys are working on and I think that's gonna be exciting to see it come to come to fruition. So I can't thank you enough for uh, tooting our horn since I wasn't going to do it for us. I really appreciate that. Uh, what an incredible panel! I'm, I'm just, thank you so much for your insights. The only thing I hope for the next five years is that I get to sixty years old, which will be five years from now. Um, let's got some time for some questions. I'm looking forward to it. Let's start with the gentleman who was first in line this morning. Uh, we got a microphone coming your way, I think. So to you guys' point about uniqueness, um, my biggest problem with like using AI tools has always been that the models are trained off generic things, meat grinders. So how do we get the models to be personal? Like how do I get a model that's based off of my music that's not online that I can use as a tool and how do we get there? That is literally what we do. We build custom models for create people who've created the music they want to be trained on or people who own it, IP holders. We just announced the very first model, base model, done in partnership with a distributor. Uh, so there's a symphonic base model being built. They have artists opting into the model. Those artists who participate, our initial release will be those artists who participate in the model are then allowed to use it as a song seed and inspirational tool. And everything that comes out of it has attribution. So when it's monetized, Symphonic can actually pay the people in the underlying pieces of content. Many artists, individual artists, don't actually have enough content to create their own base model. You don't have enough meat to be ground. Um, and I'm making fun of AI when I say that, not artists, by the way. And, uh, but if there's a base model that already exists and there are companies that have you know, sort of existing base models, then doing uh, fine tuning or conditioning with your material can result in you having a, a sustainable model that will reflect your creativity. Uh, how are other people approaching this? Yeah, I think I have, some, I have something interesting to add there. So how I've been using AI the last 
two months or so. Uh, I so uh, I trained a RVC realistic voice cloning model of one my main artist that I work with. I have a lot of material of his voice, of course. I've been recording him for five years already, and uh, I made a very realistic clone of his voice uh, with his uh, like with like he 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 thought it was funny as well. Like it was, it's all good. But um, uh, then yeah, there we we made a track. And there was one line that he wanted to replace. But I live in Berlin. He lives in the Netherlands. He couldn't come over. So what I did is I uh, did the vocal myself. And I put his voice model over my voice. And therefore, I saved him a whole trip to Berlin to record one sentence for a song. That is actually being released. Like, it's actually being used, you know? And I think RVC, so realistic voice cloning, is based on, like, some, I guess, base model of, of uh, like how a voice works. But it's already quite accessible as a creator myself who doesn't know too many things about how to train things or Python or whatever. Um, I can actually use it by like three days of research. I could actually build that for myself as a creator and I will continue using that model. Anyone else? Other question? Well, I think, you know, Lemonade's working on something really interesting as well too that you know will allow for creators to create you know private private models for themselves as well. So we're excited about the future of artists controlling you know their own models and being able to scale themselves in their own world. So I think that's where it should go. Other question? All right, he's going to make the decision. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your time. I, I wanted to ask from a technical perspective, what, what kind of uh, technical teams do you have? Are you working with partners? Do you have the tech inside, uh, in-house? Um, how are you working with that? Yeah, I can go first. I, I want to tie this question back to something that we talked about earlier. I think we were talking about like ethical AI and the concept of like other people are training on like unethical data sets. How are we going to make sure that the good guys can win? Um, well, for one, we need to have artist-driven technology companies. Um, that's what Lemonade is. Like everyone on our team is an artist first, but engineer second. Um, but like my background is at Google. I spent five years there. Uh, my co-founder uh, was the uh, science modeler for Alexa. Uh, so the list goes on. So our team is all in-house. Um, and actually, we are hiring an AI research engineer right now. Um, so if any of you guys are interested, feel free to come talk to me after this. But the overall point is I think it's really important for us to be able to, uh, yeah, just bring the technical chops that are all in-house and like fully built custom foundational models because the problem which is using things that are open source, it's going to yield generic outputs. So we want to be really specific and intentional with how we like squeeze the juice out of the meat uh, and in order to like get the best meat grinder mechanism, you need the, yeah, this is going off the wall quick. <laughs> you could take snippets of this and make like a, a bologna commercial or something. But uh, no, but jokes aside, I think it's really important not to contract this stuff out. Um, as much as we care about the music, we got to care about the engineering. Um, and I know at Lemonade, that's what we're super focused on. Yeah, I, I can speak to um, Splice, so I can't give you exact uh, job titles, but there has been an audio science team embedded in Splice since the beginning um, and has been part of the culture of Splice, which has been creator first since the beginning. Um, so all of the machine learning that's been done in that time, um, currently the AI model was not generative, so it is all about assisting the creators. So it is trained, but it is about complementary sounds, um, it's about matching those sounds, it's about improving search and discovery, um, and it's embedded in all the tools that get you to what you're looking for faster and finds you things that you don't know you're looking for, but are based on what you look for before and your history. Um, but that's definitely built around the same thing, which is musicians first, and also there's a huge proportion of people who are at Splice are musicians, and that's definitely part of the culture that drives our decisions both ethically and, I mean, these conversations are happening, I'm sure you're all having them regularly, like they're happening everywhere all the time, but they're also happening internally and we're making those decisions based on who users are and, and what they would want. I think I said this earlier that, you know, how they feel about using that product. There's no point building a product that uh, pushes away the people that you're trying to make it for just because you can, and that's definitely embedded in the team. So the technical roles are there, but it is being embedded in a culture of understanding musicians and, and those users. Okay, I'm gonna voluntarily go over time and 
uh, hurt my friend's feelings over here. Uh, one more question. Anybody? Uh, someone with the microphone is going to pick who gets to ask a question. Good luck, everyone. Oh, that was easy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is about, think about the, the consumer, the person listening to the music, as maybe AI completely generates songs from scratch on its own and then releases those. Not, not something that I've curated and half curated through, you know, through assisted tools, but a completely song on Spotify. Should I, as a consumer, like, how do you feel about should I know or should I not know? Should I have the choice to be able to say, I only really want to listen to music from AI, because I love AI, it's perfect for my business, my studio, it's the right vibe, it gets me. Or I actually want to listen to stuff that's not using AI, or it's not completely AI. That's why I'm thinking about the, the actual person that gets to listen to this at the end, that we all do this for. Yeah, my take, my wife and I were talking about this for way too long yesterday, this exact question. And I want to call this the McDonald's analogy, where um, should you know you're eating at McDonald's when you eat the burger? I think you should know, but it's still your choice if you like the burger or not. You know what I mean? But there's also a ton of gourmet burger spots where they really care about every piece of the pie or every piece of the burger. And uh, man, this beat grinder analogy is just continuing. <laughs> uh, but when they care about every single piece, then you know, man, this is a really custom, like handcrafted burger. I might prefer this more. So it's almost like I don't think people should feel guilty about listening to music that's AI generated, but I think they should know, and then they will have the ability and like the, the choice of, do I want to continue listening to this or not, because of your own personal ethics. But, uh, but that's my take. I think we should let people know, because imagine you had this delicious burger, and you're like, man, that was great, and someone patted your back and was like, that's a Big Mac. You'd be like, man, that's not as good as I thought it was, you know? So... <laughs> Huh? Great answer. I can see this thing is flashing at us. Please wrap up. It's really nice that it's polite. Uh, real quickly, I want to say, I think it's a red herring, the idea that content that is AI generated is going to be tagged. Uh, I personally don't believe there is or will be technology that is reliable to always know what was a AI generated or not. Uh, it's going to be up to consumer taste, I think, ultimately. I can't thank all of you enough. Special thanks to Helen for joining us at the last minute. What a pleasure talking to you guys. I urge anybody, if you have questions, uh, to just bum rush the stage as soon as we're done. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Stay hydrated while you're at ADE. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Matt.